Good morning, I'm Nancy Nolan Jones and we are here on August the 2nd, 2008 in the home of Mr. and Mrs. Harlow Jones. And we are here with Mr. Jones who's going to give us an uh, uh, overview of his life story. So Mr. Jones, we are so happy to be here with you today and we're pleased that you agreed to share your life story with us. Um, if you would just tell us your full name and where you were born. I was born in Cleveland, Ohio, 2173 State First Street. Um, I, um, your parents' name? My parents' name was Henry B. Jones. Mm -hmm. My mother's name was Frances Jones. Were they from Cleveland? Uh, she wasn't. She was from Pittsburgh. Really? Uh, my father was from Indiana. Mm -hmm. But they uh, came They came to Cleveland right. and had 11, 11 children, brothers and sisters. What part of Indiana was your father from? I think from Muncie, Indiana. Muncie, Indiana. Mm -hmm. and, and then uh, did they meet in Cleveland? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. My mother and him met in Cleveland. Okay. And, and your mother is from a large family in Pittsburgh? or What was her well, maiden name? Well, um... She she wasn't from really a large one. Mm -hmm. We didn't know that much of her family. Okay. You know, uh, at that time, you know, uh, women didn't say too much, mm -hmm. and they had the house all the time. Right. And uh, and the house cleaning, so they were very busy okay. uh, watching the eleven kids and who's got to go to to to, to which end. But no, none of them worked at that time. But my father, he was okay. able. Where did he work? He worked for the city of Cleveland and just numerous other places. Okay. There was a coal company here in Cleveland called Burns Coal Company. He worked for that. He had three jobs. Okay. And he had a Macklin house on 81st. It's not that way the way it looks today, but uh, it, it was great. And so he had three jobs. He worked for the coal company, and then he worked for the city. What city did he Cleveland. do for the city? He worked for the, um, the sanitary, uh, where they would... Um, Fertilize and, and stuff where rats have been and stuff like this here. Okay. Uh, he worked for that. And, uh, Exterminating kind of. Right now, I, I believe that he worked for a uh, cemetery too. Uh, Did he? Probably one on uh, uh, East 9th Street. You know. Okay. And, and so, did you know your grandparents? No. Mm -hmm. not, not either side? And not either side, no. Is there a story on how your parents met each other? Well, um... <clears throat> They never did tell us the story. Okay. But what it, what it was was that uh, my father's uh, parents died in I think when he was 13 years old. Okay. And uh, uh, it, his brothers and sisters and then kind of carried him on until he got to Cleveland. Yeah. That's, that's, um, so he was he from a large family? Uh, no, not too large. Okay. You know, but cousins and, and all of them it made it a lot right. larger. Right. You know, and a lot of those they were in Cleveland too at one time. Okay. And so then to the marriage of your parents, eleven children were born? Yes, they were. Well mm -hmm. where did you rank in there? Were you in the middle or well the ten of us was born at twenty one seventy three State First Street. Wow. Um, except the oldest one. Okay. He 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 was he was born in the hospital. Okay. But all the other ten kids was born there. The at doctor home. would come right, would come there, you know. And the doctor's office was on ninety third at that time, ninety third and Cedar Avenue. Do you remember who that doctor was? I think it might have been Doctor Evans. There was a grocery store, there was a uh, pharmacy, mm -hmm. uh drug store and he was up on the he was up on the top floor, you know. Yes. And he did, was well known. You know. Did did your family um, attend church in Cleveland? Yes, we did. And what mm -hmm. church was that? St. James and Church. Is that right? Mm -hmm. So was your mom and dad very active in the church? Well, at one time, but when I came to uh, they were they were down. All the kids was there at the time, and my father worked almost all the time. So what happened was that the activist was my mother getting us all ready to go up to St. James and Church. Right. Uh, not only just on Sundays, but through uh, Bible school and everything. Uh, I just seeing something where they say, well, I had perfect attendance there really? uh, at that time. Right. At Bible school. So, so describing a little bit about your home uh, environment with 11 children, that must have been, that must have been something to keep everybody together. How, how was, how was your mother's temperament? Was she a disciplinarian? Oh, yeah, she was. And, and, and see, one of the great things about her was this here, she had a husband mm -hmm. and he was big. <laughs> and uh, if one of them didn't do it, she said, 
watch when your daddy get home. <laughs> and that automatic, uh oh. So she was always able to maintain the discipline. Maintain right? that discipline, mm -hmm. whatever. Were there more boys and girls, or how many boys and girls? Well, um, it was, uh, oh boy, I think it was six uh, boys. And maybe 11 now. Um, five girls. Yeah, five girls. Six boys and five girls. Right. Almost evenly, half and half, huh? Right. But the the age groups was different. Right. Uh, one of my brothers over me, I didn't know that crowd, uh, and my sisters, but I knew the older ones, you know. Mm -hmm. I kind of came up with them. I was mid in between. You were in between. Sure. So, and, and I can understand that many years later, the younger ones kind of, they, they had their own little unit in the family. Right, right. Yeah. Television was out then, uh, so <laughs> they had a whole different world. They had a whole different world. Right. So if television wasn't out when you were a youngster, what, what did you do for entertainment in the home? I mean, tell the, these kids today, they, they can't live without a TV. Well, one of the things, we couldn't live without a popcorn. That you pop popcorn in the back there in the, where you had your uh, heat coming up in the living room. They had a little thing, it was like a cage, and you put your, your stuff there and you could pop right in the living room. Okay. And those were some of the things that we really did. But the main thing that we did, we really looked forward to doing, um, to go to the Knickerbocker Theater. The Knickerbocker Theater was on um, 83rd and uh, Euclid. Mm -hmm. And uh, we went there, and uh, we had to go from 81st to uh, the Knickerbocker, and at that time, it was pretty racist mm -hmm. uh, from Carnegie on over. So you were eighty. You were like Cedar and um, and Eighty First Street and yes, Cedar. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Mm -hmm. And it was an integrated neighborhood. <laughs> uh, no, no, it wasn't integrated. All the people that was here, the majority of people were um, uh, like I was uh, telling people that Zelma George, mm -hmm. who got the Zelma George which name. Uh, she lived across from me. And she was appointed by Eisenhower. She was the first person I ever seen on television, and everybody on that street was lawyer, Kellogg, um, everything from even some of the, the guys that played in the Negro League. It was finite, and it was light skinned finite. And um, um, uh, my father worked, and women didn't work. Mm -hmm. uh, they worked with us, because she probably caught enough uh, with us. Mm -hmm. That she worked too. That was a lot. That was a big job. It sure was. Keeping everybody clean and fed. Right, and keeping us together. You know, God bless them. Keeping she went to college at uh, age 63. Did she really? Mm -hmm. She was one of the rare ones. She went to uh, Cleveland State, and you know, I was still being, I was, I was incarcerated mm -hmm. then. But I thought that was really great. They had her in the newspaper. That was wonderful. So mine was really kind of up to date upstairs. Right. So. Did your brothers and sisters, you all stuck together? You had a very close-knit family? Yeah, we did. Uh, we, we had a real close-knit uh, family. Uh, that was brought on us by our fathers. Um, uh, we had to be together. So. What elementary school did you go to? Bowden Elementary. Bowden? Mm -hmm. At that time, it was on 89th and um, um, Carnegie. Okay. There's a big housing complex there right now, and Bolton, the new Bolton is over there on the uh, Hundred Street and mm -hmm. mm -hmm. But now Bolton was that an integrated school or was it mostly blacks? I can only remember one white fellow, um, and he had one of these things in his was cut here, and he lived uh, by um, Antioch Baptist Church. Mm -hmm. And after you get Antioch Baptist Church is here, and he was the first house. He was the only white that I could really uh, remember at the time, except uh, uh, most of the white teachers. Right. And, and then what high school did you go to? Uh, from there, uh, I went to uh, I went to Addison Junior High School for a while, and then uh, I left Addison and went to East Technical High School, and then I kind of dropped out then. Okay. But well, how was school for you? Take us back to that time. Was it something that you enjoyed school? Did, were you actively involved? or Help us to understand how you became the spokesperson that you are for our people. Where did you get that from? Your parents? Well, or? Uh, probably more so from there than, than school because I really had bad feelings towards the school. Did you? Yeah. I, I, was, I was really in trouble. 
that's coming up. And um, I had a teacher that just would beat me at will, you know. And I was almost at one time, the, rest of the whole year I had to stay after school, you know. And it, it, it was just horrible. I got a picture of me in this all boys class, and I was this big, and there was a white teacher. She's holding my hand, we got it. And that's one of the teachers I really loved because she put love on me. Anybody they went, these were all big, big guys. Mm -hmm. They put me in the room because uh, uh, I guess there were a lot of things I just wouldn't take from nobody. Mm -hmm. You know, and they had the bully system going at that time. And she was a uh, Afro American, she was real light skinned. I'm not gonna mention her name. No, okay. But she did some of the most horrible things. I told some other people about it years later. Mm -hmm. uh, to me, and some of the things she did, and they, it, it was just hard for me to believe that that's the way she was, you know. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if I pushed it or what. What grade were you about then? About the third grade. So that was a very impressionable age. Uh, right, and I mean, I was thrown on the ground, kicked and punched, and stuff like this here. And I took it for so long, mm -hmm. and I ran. And I remember the last thing she she said, don't you go to school Monday. And that weekend, I was scared to death, and I talked to my big sister. Mm -hmm. She said, Holly, you just go back to class, mm -hmm. you know, and don't say anything. And the teacher never said anything. Mm -hmm. But uh, she told me, she said, well, I want to see, because uh, um, what you can do so much. She said, I'm going to put you in another class. And I left that class and went to the all sixth grade boys' school mm -hmm. out of the mm -hmm. room. It was the only one in the school, and these were real big guys, and I was a little guy. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I knew how to take care of myself. Did you? And that, that teacher, Mrs. Cromer, mm -hmm. I loved her. Yes, she and is. I had my mother to send a Christmas card every year mm -hmm. uh, to Mrs. Cromer. She lived out by where Euclid Beach was. Mm -hmm. But I really appreciate what she had did for me, you know. Mm -hmm. And she told my mother, send him to school. Send him over here to Caramel House. He is great. Really? You know, right. But I never did go to Caramel House. You didn't House. get to Caramel House? No. Mm -hmm. no. Wow. Um, Reason. Okay. But uh, uh, I didn't go there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, so as you're growing up, and you went to East Tech. Was it, was it getting rough for you? Were you speaking out? Or? Well, you know, it, East Tech. It wasn't. Uh, it wasn't no problem. Uh, one of the things, though, and I think that it's fair uh, to say some of the things that could have happened to me, I probably could have caused a lot of it. Mm -hmm. And sometimes when people are defiant they in trouble. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem that I did run into when I left Bowden Elementary School and I went to Rollins Junior High School, mm -hmm. it was a different neighborhood. Oh, really? You know, yeah, they, they, the people there, uh, Bowden, uh, Rollins was a big, huge school, and the people there, were you talking about beating you up and stuff like this, they were really into it. And, and I hated it. And I seen, when I came up on um, Cedar Avenue, I saw that on Halloween, how they would come up on on uh, Cedar Avenue and they beat all the kids up because the kids there were supposed to be like the good kids. Mm -hmm. You know, they're doing good in school, they got their parents is working. It was a plush neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Zelma George and them had uh, they had people that did all their, their laundry, their, their um, spruced the house up mm -hmm. the whole bit. And there was times the street would be loaded up with cars, mm -hmm. you know, chauffeur driven over their home and stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. And we all kind of pulled together. Yes, the Afro Americans somehow believe that if you live in a plush neighborhood and this and that there, you can't fight. And I kind you of showed to, them that. You had to show them, huh? <laughs> well, I most certainly did. <laughs> you know, I think that, so people, you know, you're forced into being who you are, huh? Right, right, right. And I didn't like bullies. And I'm telling everybody, there's one thing I tell everybody, I couldn't stand a bully. Yeah. And I, if I seen somebody bully, I would grab them and talk with them. Mm -hmm. And I turned a lot of guys that were scared of the bullies that, that didn't want to fight. They said, look, I want to learn how to fight. And at that time, we did what you call body punching, mm -hmm. you know. And body punching was, was kind of worse than regular fight. You don't hit in the face. Mm -hmm. But what you do, you don't have gloves on. Mm -hmm. You hit from here down. Mm -hmm. And I was a genius said, I mean, I was a little kid, and they'd bring a 200 pounder there, and uh, I set him down. You did? Oh, all of them. <laughs> oh, my gosh, you know. <laughs> I didn't have no fear because if there was a big bully, they look and see me. I, I figured that there would be a little bully, and it did. And, and I, well, you want a box? I think I know how. Yeah. You know, but uh, 
it, 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 it kind of good for me the way I came up in life because that helped me out later on. That prepared life. you. Right. And, that, and that's, that's why we would like to hear about your upbringing because then we can hear how you became who you were. So you had to defend yourself and you, you in, immediately as a youngster did not like bullies. And so right. when you saw government bullies and things like that, man, and you sure got it right. <laughs> you sure got it right. I'll tell you some stories about the bullies over the fifth district. Yeah. But we um we we do get the picture and then right. and then um the loving home that you came from and right. with with brothers surrounded by brothers and sisters mm -hmm. and, and two parents. Which nowadays a lot of children don't have two sure, parents, right. so sure, right. you were very blessed in a lot of respects. And so then, when you decided to leave school, what was what was what helped you make that decision? Well, you know, Cleveland at that time was so great; it was a shame. You can leave school at 16 mm -hmm. and you get a job. Okay. And you know what? Nobody wanted to work for the city of Cleveland. Nobody wanted to do those type of things. And what happened was. Uh, you could quit because the steel mill, everything was booming, mm -hmm. and uh, you can get your job. Okay. And what I did is, um, I went to the city of Cleveland, okay. and I worked nine years with the sewer department. Did you? Oh yeah, as a matter of fact, just part of all the sewers in Cleveland, I've been into because I wasn't afraid to go down in the sewers and, mm -hmm. and stuff like that. But I did that, um, and I ran in trouble. Uh, mostly, a, a lot of things I did, I ran into trouble. Mm -hmm. And one of the things is, and I learned later on, you got to watch your uh, vocal pitches. You got to watch who's who. Mm -hmm. Everybody's not clean. There's people that violate the law and stuff like this here. Mm -hmm. But uh, I was one of the ones that was kind of very vocal. Mm -hmm. And I was called in one day, and uh, the head of the committee, the city was Dr. Clayton George. And um, I was let go. Right. Yeah, they, they said it for my absenteeism. And I knew something was wrong then. Mm -hmm. That people was getting together and whispering stuff, let's get rid of all that. So they blamed that on that in the city. They called me up. Why do you suppose they wanted to get rid of you? Because I was very vocal about our people mm -hmm. and the police. Mm -hmm. When I came up, what was really bad was the cowardice of us. Mm -hmm. Women at this time didn't wear pants. Mm -hmm. They wore dresses, mm -hmm. and not only wearing dresses, um, they didn't. There wasn't no thing proper for a lady to have a cigarette smoking and mm -hmm. stuff like this here. And um, the police used to be two or three policemen would come down the area of court. Uh, once Huff got black, mm -hmm. and two policemen would jump out of the car, come here, Sally Ann, and grab her. And next thing you know, she's reluctant. And next thing you know, they got the billy club beating her, and the women wearing dresses. And her dress all up over head, and they beat the person. And you know what? They beat fear in the people. And here black men stood around watching this. And they never did anything about it. There was about two or three black police officers. Um, most of them had passed away. But I knew them all. Mm -hmm. They lived over in that area too. About what period, time period was this? Well, this was in the 50s and the 60s. Early 60s. Uh, right. Mm -hmm. And the racism was still running bad. Mm -hmm. Uh, during that time because I went up to, when I was 18 years old, I went to get an apartment mm -hmm. and the woman just told me just like it was nothing, oh, I'm sorry, we don't have colored people yet. Well, and I said, thank you. Whoa. And this was up on uh, 60 something in uh, um, Euclid Avenue, mm -hmm. but everything was racist mm -hmm. and people didn't know it because they didn't talk racism. Mm -hmm. So I didn't know that, mm -hmm. uh, that they can call you boy and get away with slapping you on the back of the head and stuff like this. See, Everybody had this deep fear of the police off room, and at that time, uh, you, you could do a good whooping, and they whipped people. You know, we used to go by the old Fifth District and hear people howling all the time and stuff. And one day, I got in a fight, and um, up on Cedar, and they called the wagon, and the wagon was going around. This was almost around Christmas Eve, we were going around picking up people and stuff, and we go into this Fifth District is new. It was new then. Mm -hmm. They pulled up and then there was a car table and they were drinking and they were opening the door, taking us one out at a time. Is the car table in the, the wagon? No, no, it was it was in the fifth district. Okay. And uh, here's an old guy, about sixty five years old, real light skin. He got it first and they just punched him and beat him in his eye. When they hit him, they pulled him out and they opened the door and got a 
another one and another one. I told the blacks then, I said, man, you know what? I guess this is whooping time. And I said, I tell you what I do. I said, I'm gonna go out here the next time the door open and I'm gonna try to take the beatings that, uh, that they're gonna try to give you. They'll be tired of you. And you know what? Um, when they opened it up, I went like this and they grabbed me and I went out and I looked at them and said, you know what? So all y'all a bunch of cowards. Ain't none of you gonna fight me with these. And they did. They jumped me. They hit me. They beat me and beat me and beat me. They tore my white shirt down my back. The pants tore down. And still, I had blood everywhere. And then they threw me back in the uh, the wagon. And uh, from then on, the other ones they just slapped them around. But they didn't take me. the beating I took was just outrageous, you know. So why would they? Why did they pick you up in the first place? There was a disturbance down on Cedar. Mm -hmm. Some guys came in there and wanted to beat up some of the guys over there. And I just happened to be in there then, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And there were some ladies in there too. Because mm -hmm. they brought the ladies there. And they were trying to do things like the, the police was up there. Yeah, take your coat off and turn around. But they refused to do it. And they slapped them just maybe not and throw them in the wagon. Mm -hmm. uh, the next day we were we was released. And uh, uh, they didn't have a bond. They just let me go because they knew I'd got mine. I went to the. They had to take me to the hospital. But what had happened was, uh, my father. It's the first time I seen tears in his eyes when I came. He saw me and how bloody and how beaten and stuff, you know. But I took it, you know, and uh, I saved the other ones that was in the uh, pad. I think that maybe some of the thing about authorities, uh, people have to be careful of what they do. You know, mm -hmm. you can't let because you're a police officer mm -hmm. begin to. Uh, beat the people up and stuff. And you got to have it fair across the board and right, stuff, you know. Right. If you don't, there'll be problems. And we know that actually during the latter part of the 50s and 60s, there was a great change. Yes, there was. Mm -hmm. And I was. And you were right in the midst, midst of it. When, when was. So that was leading up to the big change. What, 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 what was the big turning point that you would say happened in the, in the 50s, 60s? Was it the Huff? Or was it the Glenville, or was it something before that? You no, know, it was something before that. You know, for some reason the blacks didn't talk. I'm shocked to see what was happening before that. Mm -hmm. When I was living, I was walking around. Mm -hmm. um, there was a guy who played with the Cleveland Indian named Al Rosen. Mm -hmm. And there was a black, the first black player of uh, Cleveland um, Indians was Larry Doby. Mm -hmm. He was uh, 1948. Mm -hmm. And this was in the late 50s or early 60s on Euclid Avenue. Mm -hmm. he, Al Rosen is a Jew, mm -hmm. his name. Him and Larry Dover was riding in Keswick uh, Cab. Mm -hmm. And when they stopped the cab, they went to get in there. And uh, so uh, Al Rosen got in there. Mm -hmm. And Larry Dover went to get in there. And he said, hey, ho, ho, I don't take no niggas around. And put him out. And, you know, I'm thinking to myself then, what do you mean to tell me this was happening? And I was old enough to find out what was happening. But those type of things was happening all over, mm -hmm. you know. We were calling niggers, 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 you know. Mm -hmm. And um, it began to get got to us. I remember all the churches mm -hmm. up and down uh, which name. We couldn't go by there and near the Knickerbocker. And I'm not going to tell you the churches because there's people are not there now. But I tell you one thing, we would call every time we were little kids, we was called niggers, niggers, niggers. You the know. church is on 105 in there? Or no, mainly on Euclid. On Euclid. Right, mm -hmm. right, right. And these weren't black churches? No, not at that time. Yes, okay. Right. And so they were calling names because you were walking in front of their their congregation. And sure. Well, yeah, and we was going to the church, I mean to the show, mm -hmm. you know. Okay. I remember one case that there was a black male, and it was right on 83rd. At 83rd, there's a gateway in there. There used to be an apartment building. Mm -hmm. And this, them little kids was calling this guy, and he might have been about 30 years old, called him a nigga, and he slapped one of them. And I remember that they come out there, they were like hillbillies, they come running out, and we got to 83rd and and um, Carnegie, and they running out there, telling me, you hit him, he said, yeah, I slapped him, let him call me a nigga again. They oh, well, we don't teach him that, and it was over with. But see, all these things get into you, mm -hmm. 
you know, and some of them hurt you so deeply, mm -hmm. especially when it comes to our people, mm -hmm. you know, that you mean to tell me this is the type of life that we haven't did anything to nobody, you know, mm -hmm. we haven't beat people up, we tried our best to go to the service and die for this country, mm -hmm. and for some reason, we was the most despised person mm -hmm. uh, on earth mm -hmm. by other uh, uh, other groups and stuff, so right, yeah. right. Wow, that, that was quite a period in your youth. That was quite an impressionable time. And, and that's when you kind of made up in your mind that this isn't fair. I have right. to speak out. Right. Well, were you, did you belong to any youth groups when you were younger? Just the church youth group? Or? Well, I would belong to the church uh, youth group. And I did things like I uh, was a paper boy. Mm -hmm. And, uh, 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 and I got with all the people. You know, uh, Zelma Joy, she was great. She kind of took me all the time, and her maid and, and all of them, when I would go to the house and do things, her maid would tell me, how oh, the hell look here. She wouldn't walk up the stairs. She would go up on her hand. Her name was Mrs. Muse. Mm -hmm. And she would tell me that Coca-Cola uh, would help keep clothes out of you and stuff. Mm -hmm. And I would go and do her windows. And they had the, the um, you know, the, the the wooden ones like we had yeah. Andy. Yeah. Um, and uh, she would call me back over and say, Holly, come here. She would have a mirror turned this way, looking at the thing, and the sun come through, she said, see there, you missed that right there. And I said, uh oh, right, and I had to go out on the roof and do the same thing over. Mm -hmm. But you know, I, 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 I love doing that. Everybody was everybody. Yeah. If we were doing something and talk too loud, we would hear something say, hey, you Joneses, if I keep hearing that there, I'm going to call your parents. And mm -hmm. Lord, when they said call your parents, we straightened up. But we had to be in at 9 o'clock. Yeah. We obeyed. That's one of the things that I'm proud of. We obeyed our mother and our father. Yes, yes, yes. And you obeyed others in the community. Oh, oh, right. Sure. Because that was when community, we hear about the time when community was community. If you did something down the street, the neighbor would tell you, don't do it, and you stop. Right, right, you right. You know, and um, so tell me, what was your first job when you got out of High school. Um, worked with the sewer department. Okay, and then oh, okay. So you didn't have to have high school diploma to work for the city. You sure did. Okay. That's, you're, you're right. That and that's that's what happened. Anybody, I don't care who they were, they could get a job in Cleveland at that time. They could work as long right. as you could work and do the job. You sure right. Isn't that something? So let's kind of just fast forward to mm -hmm. when you became more of a community icon, active. We kind of get the picture of how you grew up and in seeing injustice and knowing that you didn't care for what you were seeing and trying to do the right thing and come from a home that taught to do the right thing. So when did you become more or less a community activist? What was the first thing that triggered all of that? Well, i tell you something. I think it was my people. You know, uh, it was just like if you in a ball game mm -hmm. and you were yelling for LeBron James, come on LeBron, mm -hmm. you want him to score. Mm -hmm. You know, not because uh, he's uh, LeBron James, but because he's an Afro-American and somebody that we should all take pride of, right. you know. And um, uh, when we did things, it was great. It, no matter who we had, if it was mm -hmm. a black mayor, council person, I was always praying, please don't let him get in no trouble. You know, and stuff like this, because it would have been the first thing thrown across there. And it, I had this deep feeling that um, people wanted us to mess up. To say, what did I tell you? And that's the part that really kind of shook me up. I wanted to see us make it, mm -hmm. you know. And I used to tell people during the earlier times that uh, have some sense. Mm -hmm. We're not integrating because we want to be like you or we want to be one of you. We just want to leave that community that we in that's got to turn bad, you know, and raise our kids in a nice community. Years ago, you didn't hear anything about some of the shootings and killings and burnings and, and, and teachers getting beat up and guns being brought in school. You didn't have none of that, mm -hmm. but you have it today. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you the truth, I feel really sad, mm -hmm. and, I, and I feel ashamed too, mm -hmm. that uh, these young kids have no place to go today. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a stabbing up at the Zelma Joints, a ring up there. You can't tell your little kid to go and get a newspaper because he might be dead. Yeah. And I don't know where that cowardice got together with yeah. us. And that made me say, hey, wait a minute. Were you, were you, do you think you were influenced any by television when television finally came out? 
Um, you know, truthfully, no, I don't think so. No. Uh, I listen to the radio all the time when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I was really interested in the wars. Uh, Second World War, mm -hmm. uh, I knew all about it. Did you? You know, and it kind of fascinated me, you know. Mm -hmm. And I was really more fascinated when they talked about the Tuskegee Airmen, mm -hmm. you know, that people here was in Cleveland, Ohio. My mother went to school with Benjamin o. Davis. Mm -hmm. um, my, my dentist, blacks had the business up on Cedar Avenue. Yes, they did. And up in over Williams Auto Service, there was a dentist there. Mm -hmm. And he's the one that used to work on us and stuff. And found out when he died, oh, maybe two or three years ago, he was a nursing home. He was one of the Tuskegee people too. I was very proud of them. What is very his name? proud of them. Do you remember his Dr. Name? Mason. Dr. Mason. Right. Wow. Right. I'm out highly proud of him. Yeah, you were very proud. Tell me, um, when did you do social activities? Was there a place? I heard that Fairfax was a place where young people went for. So, so, I don't know. Yeah, I was, I was a little grown by that time. Okay. Uh, I, I remember when Fairfax was built. Okay. I might have been around uh, 13 years old. Okay. But, um... You were past that. Yeah. You know, back during times, I, I guess the gang stuff was building up, but it never happened the way it's happened today. Right, right. Um, you know, you might get punched in the stomach and lose a quarter. Mm -hmm. But the stuff that's happened today is sinful. Tell me, tell me, coming up Cedar Avenue, you know, I can just remember our seafood, but mm -hmm. and their pool halls and mm -hmm. um, just lots of lots of good things. Bars, yeah, all of them. All and good these things. Were, and, and see, the thing about it was these were black owned. Mm -hmm. The two big hotels there, Joe Lewis and them had to go down there to uh, the, um, on Fifty Fifth Street and, and which name were the big Mississippi Hotel. Remember, it was there. That's where oh, they slept yeah. when they came here. So everything was done there. And down Cedar, um, where there was jazz, they were in the bars there. No fighting, no shooting. Then up the street was the Playmore, yes. um, where you would go skating and stuff. Right. You know, it, it was great. So do you think when we were left in our own communities that we, we had a fairly good life? Oh, you, you know, i tell you the truth. I thought we had a great life. Yeah. You know, um, the bars, the, the, the hotels, the, well, I can't even think of the name of the hotel that was on um, 55th and Euclid, it'll come to me, but, um, 55th and Euclid, it was Central, that was the big one, was it Central? I got it there, there was two, and the other one was on Carnegie, the Carnegie, which had been just closed about, uh, maybe about four or five years ago, mm -hmm. you know, and the one on, on uh, which, and that's where the, uh, the, the black singers and all them when they would come. Cedar just was it. Yeah. The lights was flashing. Yeah. And you could walk down there and yeah. It, you were safe. It, it was great. Right. People respected people. Right. You didn't have sure to worry right. about getting mugged. You're right. And boys and girls respected the elders. Right. And not only that, there was believe it or not, uh, people didn't know that uh, we was highly respected by our black sisters. Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't no thing that you were going to jump in bed with anybody, mm -hmm. you know, or pass a disease and stuff. None of that stuff ever happened. Everybody I met during that time, they were very polite. Mm -hmm. And if, 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 if she was, he was trying to be her boyfriend and she didn't like him, she just tell him he goes on about his way, you know, mm -hmm. and stuff. But things have really changed so bad. And uh, I see in this country here, because uh, I was a STD uh, worker. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of things they wasn't telling our public. Mm -hmm. And I got grandkids that's coming up, and I'm scared to death. Yes. You know, we've got to teach them. They've got to do things. This thing about a person saying, oh, dad's old, I don't want to hear him. Right. Mama, she come up in a different time. Right. You know, somehow we're going to have to be good enough to convince them right. that what we're telling them is because we love them. Right, right. And this is for the best benefit of you. That's exactly right. Um, you know, I, I've heard before this interview started, you told me a little bit about um, cleaning up the King Kennedy area and then also working with um, Mayor Carl Stokes. Can you tell me, did you have anything to do with Mayor Stokes' campaign and helping him get elected? Did you share in any of that? Yeah, kind of up under the table. Did you? Yeah. Did you pass the word in the community that right. he was a good guy? And, and see, what it was is, uh, uh, you, you sometimes you got too fashionable people. 
Mm -hmm. I was highly respected by the people uh, in the inner city. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got a poster, and I'm going to keep it. So when you get ready to open up your uh, museum, okay. I'm going to bring that out. It's a poster about this big, uh -huh. and I got my Afro set uniform on, and I'm pointing out and say it's registered to vote. Okay. You know, they were using this, you know, Good. to help to get the blacks, which, in it, because Carl knew then, and a lot of other people that I have a, a good large following. Yes, and and that following was the Afro set in place by then. Sure. Can you tell me about the Afro set? I think that was probably your first real strong organization. Right. Uh, um, it's called Afro Set. Right. I named it that. How did it first get started? Was well, let me tell you this here. There was a there's a book out mm -hmm. by Lewis Robinson. Okay. Um, he, I read in the paper, he had been to college and everything, I read in the paper, there was a doctor, uh, not a doctor, it was a, he was a reverend, uh, that was helping the blacks uh, to try to integrate Cleveland. And they, it, what they did was, they had uh, went up to Murray Hill. It's always been an Italian community. We all knew about Murray Hill. You just don't walk up there. You, you get a whooping, you know, or you disrespect one of those, uh, 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 Italian uh, elderly sister. They don't play that. So one of the things is they went up there. It was a bunch of whites and blacks, and uh, I wasn't in the civil rights then. But they go up there, and next thing you know, everything was thrown at them. They got beat up. Reverend Younger, mm -hmm. yeah. he went over, and over on Lakeview, they got these schools mm -hmm. that's empty. And they said, well, why don't you just send those schools up there in Murray Hill? Belongs to Cleveland schools, too. Mm -hmm. So why don't you just fill them up? You got nobody in there. Mm -hmm. And at least one thing, that the money could be used for something which they, uh-uh. And they got the throwing stuff at them, and they run them out. As they came out, uh, and I read this in the newspaper, as they came out of Murray Hill, the police was all up there. They never did anything. So when they got to the bottom of the hill, the sky Lewis Robinson had made an announcement. He said that if we, if you don't protect us, I'll form a Negro Rifle Club to protect uh, the, 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 the people. Mm -hmm. And he wasn't talking about specifically black mm -hmm. because he was married um, to a, a white sister, mm -hmm. you see to I me. Mean? And um, uh, when he said that, all hell broke loose. What? And he had a good job. I don't think he could work dishes after that. I mean, <laughs> black men with guns, man, he caught it. And he caught it so bad that all of a sudden, what they did was, um, by him losing his job and everything, Reverend Young went there. He was a white man. He put his body across in the, over there. And the bulldozer that was planning to tear down the, to put a Negro school there, the bulldozer run over to the, the white uh, clergyman and oh, killed him. Oh His name God. was Reverend Younger. So it was a lot of the uh, Reverends were just great here. Uh, they had more guts than Carter's got a little bit of appeal. I mean, they were strong. Mm -hmm. And he, they lost. So that's one of the reasons why Robinson made that mistake. But let me go back on that mistake. The mistake was telling people this, there was something completely honorable. There's nothing there, the, the, the National Rifle Association, all of You can have the Constitution guarantee this. But a black man, and Robinson was planning on talking to the uh, National Rifle Association and stuff like that, which I think they were kind of racist too. And, and they were going to uh, uh, put a, up a Negro rifle range. Mm -hmm. And Robinson might have just said it on the spur of the moment, but all hell broke loose. I don't think mm -hmm. he, well, he might have washed dishes after that, <laughs> but they was on him. And uh, I go there, I see this in the newspaper. So what I did, I was with a fella, and not only with him, I was with another guy who was a bus driver. Mm -hmm. We go to this address that was on Kelton. And man, it's all dark. And we got ring the door up and they, all right, fellas, get in here. And they get us in there, man, and we go in there and they talking this here commando stuff, you know. And you know what, we used to go up there and we had been up there for, let's say, about two months, mm -hmm. once a week. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, one guy, oh, he was witching and one guy said, look, uh, he said, man, look here. He said, you know what? We all been around here a couple of months, man, and I don't know his name or know nobody's name. Next thing you know, this brother was in his face telling him, look, if you was a snitch, I'd take your head. You understand? You know, why you want to know names and stuff? And the guy didn't make no which name, but I test him then. I say, hey, yo, 
the cat is asking some good questions. Uh, maybe so. I know people. You know, all this kid stuff. That same guy, he never went on the range. But we did have a place in Orwell, Ohio. Went on the rifle range? Right. We built one. Whoa. And what happened was uh, the guns that was bought were legal guns. You could go down, I don't know if you know what, uh, what was the record mark down there on the prospect? Yeah. You can go right next door. There was an Army Navy store. You can walk in there and pick up all the guns you want. And they, uh, 7.65 uh, millimeter, take a person's head off. Italian carbine, and I think that's the gun that killed. The Italian carbine is the one that killed uh, Kennedy. Yeah. I mean, guns was $19, which name, and, and you know, you can buy rolls of ammunition. And it was legal. So mm -hmm. they, they went, uh, it, it, it all turned into a disaster. Mm -hmm. You know, later on down the field that I would inform you about that, but it turned real bad. And from then on, we were getting all types of uh, stuff. So Robinson called me, and uh, I told Robinson that, that I'd like to be in that wedding. So I would go there, and me and my wife would go out to, uh, and we'd do some training and stuff like this here, all self-defense. And um, uh, we had. Uh, started one we, we, we were having a little problem. Then uh, Robinson said, well, listen, open up a place, you know, and we're going to call it the JFK House. And this was all open, and that was the place on 89th Street. And the JFK House had a picture of John F. Kennedy mm -hmm. and had a picture of Jomo Freedom Kenyatta. Mm -hmm. So both of them was the JFK House. And what we did is, we figured that it would probably be good for us to begin to work with our youth or anybody. It didn't make no difference. Uh, it could be a, a grandmother. Your thing got off. Okay. It could be a grandmother. It could be a grandmother or a grandfather. We didn't turn and close the door on nobody. Mm -hmm. We brought the seven basic principles mm -hmm. here. Um, oh yeah. The Kwanzaa principles? Oh sure, from Milano Ron Karinga. Mm -hmm. I went all over. I went to California. I went all over speaking. Mm -hmm. I spoke here to the Cleveland Police Department. Mm -hmm. And what I did is, and this is something that people can remember, I talked like they talked. Mm -hmm. I know there's a lot of Italians in the police department. Mm -hmm. I know there's a lot of Irish because I started studying the history. And nobody can say I'm wrong what you're doing yourself. Mm -hmm. And I told them when I would speak about black Americans, I would speak what would hit to them. Mm -hmm. Anytime um, uh, a person who's uh, Italian gets something, I didn't start that years ago. Mm -hmm. if, if a black man was able to, like Joe Lewis, mm -hmm. Joe Lewis would knock a guy out just like this. Mm -hmm. The whole street, people would run outside and scream. And they, I mean, they were so proud. And they just don't know when we got Larry Doby, people like, we was always a, a race of people that was proud. Mm -hmm. So we was always pulling and always pulling for them. So the thing, the thing that happened was, this is what we was indulging in there. Mm -hmm. We don't want to be the man on the bottom. Right. We don't want y'all giving LeBron James the needle. Right. You know, we don't want none of this. We've got to help our, our race. Right. The problem is this, that we think, uh-oh, if I say something, I'm going to get by, uh, uh, what's your name? Or, look, let me tell you something. A guy just got burnt up. I mean, they just burned him up. You, you heard about that. 90, what, about 95% of them would burn up. That guy don't, I don't care what color he is. He don't belong with us or your kids. You know, he is wrong. You know, and you know what, doing that there, I don't know how he think that anybody got some respectability for a person to do some of the things that they're doing. Right. Young people never die. Right. You know, I remember once when we had almost a population of a million. I was a kid. I remember a killing in Kennard School. Mm -hmm. I never seen the guy. I never seen the guy that killed him. It was so outrageous that a, a guy going to school gets killed. I could tell you who shot and killed him. I could tell you um, who he was. His name was uh, uh, Jackie Hart. And he wind up and got get, get killed because he went to bully the guy again. And the guy had his baby and gave it to a guy. But this time he had a gun and he shot him. You know, he shot Jackie Hart and killed him. The, the reason why I'm telling you this here is, we had a population, it must have been around 800 to 900,000, almost a million people. Mm -hmm. I can remember this incident because it didn't happen before. Right. You know, 
black people wasn't carrying guns and shooting right. people and stuff like this right. here, see? Right. So one of the things is that the first thing you got to do is people can't get scared. Mm -hmm. And people are scared. I got things to tell you about the the uh, the housing project. We're worse than the state of Ohio. Can you tell me tell me when when the Afro said I, I want to hear a little bit about them? Okay. They started and um, sure. was this after the rifle range? Oh sure, sure. The rifle range didn't last. Oh, okay. It didn't last for a little while. Okay. And I think Robinson just made that uh, uh, He was wishing that he could do something. Right. Yeah. And Robinson wasn't a violent man or anything like this mm -hmm. here, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, that's one of the things that uh, I didn't learn anything from that, mm -hmm. you know. And um, uh, the reason why I said I didn't learn anything from that, I learned other things. And I think I knew most of everything. I tell you, I knew what was happening. And you believe it or not, it was just shameful when I see people get beat and stuff like this here, you know. I feel bad and it probably bring tears on me watching a movie. And the movie ain't real. Right. You know, if some little kid can't walk to the neighborhood because they want to hurt. I just had that deep inside me, right. you know, and, and, and that's what really kind of getting get me together. But um, at this time, I tell you, what was great was uh, the Civil Rights Movement. Okay. You know, and that I, was when Afro set started? Oh, yeah, sure. And uh, uh, Dr. King, and I love, love that brother today, Dr. King and all the young people. Mm -hmm. I watched the movies of them uh, not long ago, mm -hmm. and what killed me was, boy, we wasn't we were great people. They, Dr. King had over a thousand school kids. Mm -hmm. The little girls were still used to wear the little bobby socks, had he like the hair. And do you know what? They would come marching down the street with them, and here's the guy with dogs and water holes, and tell them, y'all get back, and they keep on singing and keep going. Put a thousand of them in jail. The next day, there was another thousand youth that came out. It tells you one thing, everything lies in your youth. You the teacher, but those are the youth. Right. And Dr. King was the teacher, and they led them and led them. They got beat, uh, dogs biting on them, everything, and they're American citizens. Did we have that happening in Cleveland? Oh, sure, yeah. We did? Yeah, we had the SCLC. I worked with them. Uh -huh. um, we had a core and the whole bit. Uh -huh. When Dr. King's uh, brother died, uh, Reverend Osborne, he's back down there. See, you see Hosea Williams is one of his eight. We worked, man, what was so good, we worked with all those groups if there was a problem. Mm -hmm. Only one group I didn't work with, I was called down on 55th Street, and black people were getting food and blankets and stuff together, and they told me, they said, Harlem, we want you to carry this here down in Mississippi. Uh, they starving the people and stuff. And I said, i got to tell you the truth. I said, can't go through Mississippi. They said, why? I said, I can't play that. I ain't going to let nobody spit on me with me. They got to kill me. And I said, I'll take it down there with some guys. And if anything runs in there, we're going for broke. And see, the thing about it was, you don't go out there and sign one of Dr. King's card that you allow people to beat you and this and that. And then uh, you say, yes, I'm going to allow that. And then all of a sudden in the newspaper or the television, uh, you can pull out a gun and shot one. The King is brutal. Yeah. So what you had to do, when you when you swore on that paper what you would do, you had to do it. And I knew, being honest with myself, that I would not let that happen to me. Right, right. You know, so and I told other people that if you're going to join these organizations, mm -hmm. and there's a Dr. King who got these rules and regulations, if you can't do it, don't take it. Right, right. But they did it. They laid on the floor, they got stomped and beat. And those things impressed me with, mm -hmm. with people. They, oh, the greatest violence. times, it was the greatest times. Uh, that I had here on earth is during the civil rights movement. Civil rights movement. How, had the FO, had, had the FO set started then? Uh, we started, sure. Who, mm -hmm. who were the founding members? Well, Harlow Jones, <laughs> uh, 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 Mr. Robinson, uh -huh. uh, his wife Beth. Okay. She was European American, but she was great. Uh -huh. You know, uh, and we opened up there. Robinson called me. And he Where got did you open up? We was up on 80, we was about 87, uh, what, 87, 86 in um, Superior. Okay. And then, what was your mission? To work with that neighborhood. 87th and Superior? Right, because to behind us, you get whipped. The Explain. whites was there, they were just awful. Okay. 
In other words, when this side is superior, mm -hmm. blacks, mm -hmm. you get on this side of superior, you start going that way, you was in trouble. Okay. And many of black kids used to come up there riding their bikes through the park, and little black kids would come there bleeding, where they would beat, uh, throw rocks at them and all this type of stuff. Cars would go through uh, the boulevard down there, they would stone them and stuff, and maybe you didn't know that this was happening, and you go down there and you run on the grass, they arresting you and stuff like that. All that stuff was happening on the other side and blacks couldn't go there. So you started your organization to do what? Well, you know, to work with my people. To educate them? Sure. Mm -hmm. And to tell them what? We've got to stick together mm -hmm. and we got to be proud. Mm -hmm. You know, the first Afro that was did in this city, we had a, a woman that come here, you might know her name, Willamie Mallory. I understand by the, 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 the woman that was here, uh, report that talked with me, Willamine Mallory had died and stuff. But Willamine Mallory came in, she had this afro mm -hmm. and it's small. And we're doing everything. You couldn't buy no African products, you couldn't get no African garbs or anything. And what we began to do is teach our culture. We started, uh, uh, and I, I got fumes of it too, mm -hmm. where the, uh, we would make them, mm -hmm. and the sisters would make them. We had drummers, we had everything. We divided everything of what they were for in the community. Mm -hmm. uh, the brothers was called Afro Set Commando. Okay. And when you got to the rank, you had a black, red, and green thing here. And it says, uh, it says Elite Squad. And they were our top guys, you know. And these guys was able to defend themselves like I was. Mm -hmm. um, the gangs used to come over from Huff. Huff was bad. They used to call Huff Rough Tough Huff. Really? And, and I mean, they were bad. Yeah, up there. None of these nice stuff you see it where people don't believe that, that Huff could have possibly turned the way it did. You know, they turned back away. But back there, you would get fed out there. They used to come over there on, on uh, over there on nuclear and jump on the guys. And uh, uh, one day it was five of us and it was on, uh, I had won my uh, respect from the people in the neighborhood. And five of us was cleaning up after a uh, Halloween party. And I looked out the window and asked him, it looked like a hundred times. They had pipes and all this stuff. And I said to the brothers, I said, hey, look, we got, we got a little problem when we go out here. I said, y'all take a look. And they looked and said, wow. But what the guys on Huff didn't know, we knew how to fight. And we were trained how to fight. That if it's five of us, we stick together. We don't break off and you run here and you run there. That what we do is turn our back, you know, and all five of us is in a, in a group. And what we would do is take that five group and we smash them here and really lay them out. And then we get this group, you know, instead of you just run. Because individually you'd be in trouble. This is watching your back. And we trained them now. And anyway, they came there and uh, one of the brothers, uh, he's still living, but one of the brothers went out there to talk nice to him. You know, some people you can't do that. And I've always told him, don't walk in the middle of a crowd. And that day he was in there and one of them guys stabbed him. You know, he didn't die, but us five came out there, we carried it to him, and they was gone. Hmm. Pipes, everything dropping, and he ran back up on her. One of our members, and he's kin to me now, one of our <laughs> members said, man, you know why I joined the Apple set? I said, why is that? Man, I was with that crowd. He said, I never seen five guys with some butt like y'all did. <laughs> and boy, he said, he joined. And he's, he was one of our good uh, commandos too, but he wanted to learn and he came down. And we we went up on Huff, if somebody got beat, I go in the bars and they all looking mean and I pull the jukebox out. We had a, a, a sister that was missing and they said that um, that a pimp had took her and stuff. And I went to all the bars that I knew were girls and I knew that night. And I went in there and said, look here, ain't no girl gonna walk the street selling her body unless they bring that sister back. You know, that's a Muslim sister. And we went through it, we went downtown, all the bars. The message got there. The police told me, so you know what? We should have had your police officer. Say, wasn't the girl selling nothing in Cleveland after you went through all those bars and stuff. And she was back that Monday morning, you know. But I, I've had to let that go because I found out that the people that told me uh, that, that the girl was of age, you know, but he still brought her back, and um, uh, those are the type of things that we was always doing. Doing was working. things to make it better. Right, and there was times, and there's a times that 
You know, sometimes people don't listen to their dads mm -hmm. or their moms. Right. But they'll listen to you or you. Yes. You know, and sometimes uh, it's best yes. to hear another person say it because you know, oh, kid, oh, that's mama. She just yes. telling me that. Yes. That's daddy. He just don't want me to be a hip hop guy. You know, but you know, we can put things together. Right. And you know what? Anytime that we get to defeat this attitude that we cannot change our race, we're going down. I still have it. And I still say to myself that all of the blacks have it. But they just got to learn. 80% of us can't sit back and say, man, I'm, you know, them niggas alone, man. They, they're killing people up, up on, on 55th Street and this and that. They, them drug boys is dangerous, you know. But sometimes we got to tell them that these things, we don't lie on our race. Right. Let me tell you something. If a hundred guys went up there with Harlem and told them, you and Cleo's corner, we ain't going to have this stuff on this corner here. You know what I'm saying? you got to get tough because that's the only thing they understand. And that's what you did. You cleaned up the communities. Oh, sure, sure. You definitely did. The Afro set um, grew and grew. Did it take long to grow or people joined you? It flourished. And it flourished so good. There's other articles in this paper mm -hmm. where the, the, the head of the witch name's name is Bill Williams, I think. It's in there. I'm going to refer you to that. Uh, he was out there saying, I don't know what they talking about, the apple said, how bad it was. There was a big plank broke up here by the school up there mm -hmm. years ago. And they took all the people out of the houses and stuff and put them in the, the Martin Luther King school. Mm -hmm. And uh, all of a sudden the whites turned around, here's 50 apple said people marching in. They didn't tell the police what to do or anything, they just started working. They started embracing the women. They started bringing food and comfort and everything. He turned around there, now here, this is how else do that people are all, he turned around and said, look, I don't know, but man, this man looks good. Said they came in there and worked with their people, we didn't ask for a dime. And in that paper that I have here, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'll get it in the end. Uh -huh. Right. Uh, he said it different. Two or three other people said, you know what, well, why did Carl Stokes call on R.L. all the time? He had common sense. He knew me. Mm -hmm. And what happened was when Dr. King died, uh, I was hurt. I ain't going to tell you. I'm going to tell you the truth. I was hurt. And I got a phone call. And it was Carl Stokes. And Carl Stokes said, Harlem, he said, look, this is a bad day for us. He said, man, all over the country, the neighborhoods are going up. He said, but Harlem, I wanted to tell you something. You knew Dr. King, Reverend Osborne and them, and he said, don't you think the most fitting way the king would appreciate it in memory of him is a nonviolent city. He practiced nonviolent and passive resistance. And you know what? It was like somebody slapped me and said, wake up. Because when Carl Stokes told me that on the phone, I said, man, you're right. He said, pass the word around. And I went to Ahmed Evans, all of them. They begin to walk the street and say in homage of, of um, of um, Dr. Martin Luther King mm -hmm. would be a nonviolent city. Cleveland, and it's in the record, was the only major city in the United States that didn't have one firebomb. Wow. And it was so great, the whites said, oh my gosh, this is great. And this is what you're talking about, taking care of yourself. Yes. But you know what happened after that? What happened after that, a program opened and they went down. Uh, one of the groups took some money, they were called Project Afro, and there were three places that they were going to fund. We never took funds from nobody. And for our African shop, uh, for Ahmed Evans' group, you heard of him? Mm -hmm. Okay, and another group on, um, on uh, St. Clair. Mm -hmm. And uh, it wasn't long after that, they studied him putting the money for culturalism. They went to that place I was telling you, mm -hmm. and and some some and this is off the record. That's where the, the weapons were bought from. Well, they know it's on on that there, you know. But that's where they were uh, bought from. And I just got a call from some people. That I did two hours on the phone, and she was she was European American, and she mentioned the lawyer that I had. She asked me questions about that Glenville uh, uh, riot, and she said, "Mom was a bad guy, wasn't he? Well, why would he do this?" And I said, "No, no." He was a good guy. I knew him. I, I disagreed with him uh, on his principles. Uh, I got very angry with him one time and told him I'd give him a good work because I'd fight anybody. And I was tall. He had a bare bone voice. 
but, but he got mixed up. He worked for the railroad, I understand, and he wind up, he never got out of prison. Uh, he died there. But I told him before I left prison, I said, you know what? Get you a lawyer. I knew the guy had nothing to do with that thing but right now. It, it could have been the same because they got their guns, the guns that was bought. These were young guys, 21, 22. It wasn't but maybe less than eight of them. And all of a sudden, the war went on. And I mean, there was killing and shooting. And George Forbes uh, came. I was watching on that date. Uh, uh, what's the guy that did all the dancing with the big hair? Uh, just died. Um, James Brown. Yeah, right. Yeah, Jim. James, James Brown. Brown. Mm -hmm. James Brown was on. And you know what? George Ford carried me up there, and you thought it was Vietnam. Willis was looking through the wall. This was in Glenville? It was Glenville, right.